talk is by uh, Professor Steinmacher.
Okay, so the simplest case is clearly scalar in theory, at least from a conceptual point of view. So you can start with your favorite non-commutative space given by some algebra. So for example, you can take quantum plane, non-commutative tori, process spheres, process CPN, whatever you like. And well, for my purpose, it will then be useful, well, it will be essential actually, to have a representation of this algebra of functions on some Hilbert space. Well, then your field, phi of x, so it is now it's an element in the non-commutative algebra, and since you have a representation, it will be some linear operator on that Hilbert space, and we'll assume that these operators are mutual. Furthermore, the trace replaces the integral, and then you can start down, start to write down some model, for example, the non-commutative phi 4 model would look something like this. So there is a kinetic term. Uh, I forgot to mention usually on these spaces here also have concepts like derivatives, there are symmetries, and so on. So there is some more structure. And I assume that we have all this available. And then you want to write down the kinetic term, interaction term, mass term, and well, this, is, this replaces the integral. And if you like, you can also expand your function in plane waves and very usual things that one knows in and of course, well, the most interesting question is what happens, what, what about quantization of these field theories? Now formally, you can go ahead and define some kind of a path integral, so you, you can define correlation functions as weighted averages over your, your, your sum of all possible field configurations. So for example, if you're expanding the plane waves, you can formally define such things. And in particular, you can get that derived in theory, for the free case. But then you notice immediately that the first main distinction is that you now have to distinguish between planar and non-planar diagrams. This is just as in the case of matrix models, as we found this morning. And well, the, pro the propagators look as usual. And then, uh, now let's go ahead and let's compute one loop uh, contributions to the, to the propagator. So there are basically, there are basically now two types of diagrams. So essentially you have to compute, first of all, sorry, yeah. well, it'll be very simple. So the first type of diagram is just this one. But then there is also not non planar contribution. Can I? Uh, so first of all, planar diagram, which looks something like this. And then there is also non planar contribution, which looks essentially something like this. So you contract non-neighboring things. And if you evaluate these integrals, the result is different. Namely, the planar uh, contribution is the same as, as you know. It's particularly in four dimensions, it quadratically diverges, so you have to choose some kind of a cutoff. However, the non-planar <coughs> diagram looks like this. There is now an oscillating uh, phase in the, under the integral. And this means that as long as the external momentum P is not zero, so P is the external momentum here, then the integral is actually convergent. So that's nice. However, if you now let p go to zero, then the phase factor I mean, it disappears, and then you, you pick up the old quadratic diversion. So this has a rather non-trivial behavior. You can summarize it something like that. So in particular, it is finite as long as p is not zero. However, there is a singularity in the infrared when p goes to zero. And this is known, essentially, this leads to QBIR mixing, has been discussed first by, you know, by these people. And this really seems to be a very crucial and central feature of non commutative defeat theories. It comes up all the time, and somehow one has to, to, to come to terms with it. It means something, and one has to understand it. And it's also, in particular, it's a very serious obstacle to perturbative to randomization, which in some special cases has been overcome, but in general it is, it is a problem. Now let's look at this in, in some more detail. Um, so let's sum this planar and non-planar, all, all the contributions to the uh, effective actions, action up to one loop. And this is now the, this is the effective action as a function of the external, sorry. Okay, the non-planar contribution looks like this. This is what I said before, the infrared it has a singularity, and otherwise it is nice. And if you now add this to the free, so if you add the p square part and the planar one, then the complete uh, one loop action looks like this. So for large momenta it, is, it goes like p square. For small momenta again it diverges. And in particular you see that there is a minimum at non-zero momentum. And so how do the units compare with lambda? 
Uh, well, lambda is very far out. And so this is this is much much below, far below the cutoff. So the cutoff is pretty low. And well, this is now. If you think of this in terms of model and statistical mechanics, this really suggests that. Well, first of all, that the momenta, the modes with very small momenta are some kind of are stiff. They are suppressed. They don't really enter the low energy sector. And also, it suggests that the minimum, so the vacuum of the theory, is actually a non-zero moment. So it might suggest that there is some kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking to a vacuum with non-zero momentum. So translation invariance will be broken. So this was suggested in a paper by Kupsu and Sondi quite some years ago. And the interesting thing is, it really seems to be true. Namely, there have been now numerical simulations of such models, and they really find some kind of, well, they call this striped phase, because if, if translation invariance is broken, it, there is a, a preferred momentum, so there will be something like a cosine, cosine of P. This will be the vacuum. And so this leads to some kind of a stripe pattern. And such stripe patterns have really been found in numerical simulations, at least in two and three dimensions. And this new strike phase has also been called matrix phase by, by one of these uh, people. And I like this name very much, and you will see why. Okay, so now let's try to understand this a little bit better from an analytical point of view. So first of all, we certainly need a clean formulation of these models because everything is divergent, and so far I've had a cutoff which is not very well, not very clean. Model. But there is a very nice setting where you can make all this rigorous if you want. Namely, let's consider compact non-commutative space. So for example, first is EPN, non-commutative tori, S2 times S2, all kinds of examples again. And it turns out that first of all, if you have a non-compact the compact non-commutative space, it means that the dimension of the Silbert space is fine because the dimension is proportional to the volume. And moreover, one can sort of scale these non-compact spaces in such a way that locally they really look like the quantum plane that we were talking about. So roughly speaking, I mean, you sit on some compact space and then you blow up the radius and make it very large in a, in a particular way such that locally it looks like a quantum plane. This is also the result. We'll actually hear more about this in the next talk. And then you can write down corresponding scalar models on this non-compact space, which qualitatively look the same as before. But now they're really completely modified because the fields are now simply Hermitian n times n matrices. Because the algebra of functions is now replaced by the algebra of I mean sorry, by the algebra of n times n matrices. So in particular, but well, I want to point out a few things. Uh, I, I will choose this particular um, regularization if you want, but that's not really good. So the qualitative features do not depend on whether I choose the CPN or some Tora or Toros or, or whatever. I just use this example because it has some nice properties. Okay, first of all, it turns out that the propagator here is really the same as in that space, except that there is now a, a cutoff, which is given essentially by the size of the matrices. So the size of the matrices gives you the cutoff. And moreover, these models are now essentially matrix models, at least, well, at least the potentials are matrix models, so they are traces over polynomials in the fields. However, the kinetic term breaks the UN, UN invariance of the matrix model. So this is a complication here. Nevertheless, the quantization of these models, in particular the, the partition function, is completely well defined. So it's not just formally, it's really well defined because it's an integral over finite matrices. Can, can, yes. can, can you make some kind of tricks like uh, scaling with, with theta and oh. taking the large theta limit and go to true matrix model? Yeah, 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 this is somehow this is error. Yeah, we'll do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. In what sense uh, the non commutative space is uh, somehow arbitrary? If you take instead of CPN, uh, fuzzy sphere times fuzzy sphere times fuzzy sphere, you get the same Yeah, you, you will come to the same conclusion. Because the symmetries are completely different. And they don't, the symmetries are not important for this. In particular, I will talk about phase resistance and so on. The symmetry, these things are not really crucial for what I will talk about. Of course, it, it, they, they, are, they are different, but for what I will talk about, they are not crucial, I think. So the, all the arguments that I will bring are really quite independent of these details. Sure, 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 of course, yes. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, these are sort of sub-leading contributions to what I, I want to uh, but can you say it even more and say that the, uh, part of your result could be obtained uh, considering instead of uh, a fuzzy space, a lattice? 
with the differential calculus that is uh, two n dimensional? Uh, you probably end up doing the non-commutative torus. In that case, yes. I mean, a, a, a matrix version of the non-commutative torus. Uh, then this 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 looks a little bit like that. This, and then yes, you arrive to the same conclusions. So the, the torus of Sabo and beyond. Ah, we can discuss this. Anyway, so, so let's assume so we have these models and we want to study them. And of course, well, because phi is an emission matrix, it's now not very natural to just diagonalize them. So there is always a unitary matrix and some eigenvalue is phi i, so you can write phi in this way. And then the path integral, of course, I can rewrite, we've already seen it this morning, by as an integral of the unitary matrices and an integral of the eigenvalues. And I pick up a Jacobian, which is just the random one determinant of these eigenvalues. This is we know very well now. And now, well, the, the idea is to study the eigenvalue sector of this model. So instead of studying the full field theory, I will just consider a small sector of the field theory and then the eigenvalue sector. So let's consider the partition function, which is the integral of our matrices. And let's write the integral as above. Now, for the potential, um, the potential is independent of the unitary matrices. So I can write the potential in front of this integral, however, the kinetic term, I cannot evaluate. So let's give it a name. So this is an integral only for the kinetic term over all unitary matrices. And this is kind of the non-trivial function here. And let's give it a name. Well, first of all, it depends only on the eigenvalues. And it is an analytical function of the eigenvalues, because the integral is a compact space where you integrate over. So it's positive analytic, therefore I can write it in this form. And then I can write the partition function in this form again. So now I can basically integrate back in the unitary matrices and I can formulate the partition function as a partition function for a matrix model where the effective action is the potential from the original V-theory but the kinetic term has been replaced by this so far unknown function of the eigenvalues model. So this is now an effective matrix model, but unfortunately so far I don't know the function f. So I want to find the function f. If I know the function f, I know everything about the thermodynamics at least of the field theory. Okay, so let's try to understand this function a little bit better. And now comes, so this is now the, the non-trivial claim. So, so far I've only written things. And now the claim is the following. Let's assume that we are in a not, in deep in the non commutative regime, which means that the cutoff is much larger than the scale of non commutativity. I will always assume this for now, otherwise it doesn't work. Now in this case, I claim that first of all, the bus integral induces a measure in the space of eigenvalues, which is sharply localized, and this is just due to UVR mixing. And these eigenvalue sectors can be analyzed using the saddle point method. And second, that at least for weak coupling, um, the effective action for this eigenvalue sector can be written explicitly. it's just this one. So I claim that the kinetic term is replaced just by an ordinary Gaussian matrix model. This is the interacting part which I had before, and okay, this is just some numerical. And there is an important constant which is alpha zero squared, it's a function of the, of the mass, and that one is, is the word. So in four dimensions it goes like lambda squared. Lambda is the color. Okay, and the, okay. The claim is also that the eigenvalues, uh, sorry, the eigenvalue distribution of this matrix model, the scale of the eigenvalues is given by, by this function alpha zero. So alpha zero is kind of the range of the eigenvalues that occur in this model. So perhaps you can remember this. So now we have to justify this and let's start with the free case. So I claim that in the free case I can replace the action by a simple Gaussian matrix model as far as the eigenvalue sector is concerned. So how do we justify that? Now the proof is as follows, so let's just compute all the observables which depend only on the eigenvalues, namely those are just well, traces of phi to some power n and products of these guys. So these are all the observables which depend on the eigenvalues. And now I will evaluate these observables in the field theory and then show that they are reproduced by this effective model. That's the strategy. So it's quite simple. And one just has to compute these observables now. And let's start. Very briefly, let's start with the simplest one. So this would be, all of these observables are of course highly divergent, but we have regularized everything so it's under control. So this one is, turns out to be this standard integral. This is just what I called alpha zero squared before. And well, the first non-trivial case is the integral of phi to the fourth, because now there is planar and non-planar contributions. And now it turns out 
the, the non-planar contributions for such observables can be neglected completely in the large n limit, so in the limit of large coupling. And let me very briefly sketch this. This is just the easy um, uh, Okay, I will be very brief here, I don't have time. So if you rescale the field by this divergent factor, then it turns out that the non-planar contributions they are always rapidly oscillating integrals with over compact space, and the oscillations are faster and faster as you take the cutoff to infinity, so it should go to zero. While the planar contributions, sorry, so the whole term is given only by the planar ones, and the planar contributions are pretty combinatorial. So they just, you just have to count the number of planar conductions of, of a single vortex in two n things. So this is now like in a few like this model, and the result is just this number. Moreover, you can show that these, these observables factorize, and then you conclude that, okay, the general uh, expectation value of such a general observable is, is given by this one here. Now, on the other hand, it is very well known that precisely this result is reproduced by the Gaussian matrix model of this form. So this is a, essentially establishes the claim. <coughs> Namely, that the effective action for the eigenvalue sector for the free case is given by this Gaussian matrix model. And, okay, this is a numerical shift which is just put here in order to reproduce all the definition function. Okay, now this model can be solved, everything is known about it, it's very trivial. Um, in particular, it is known that um, it is dominated by, by sudden points, and the sudden points are given by well, certain eigenvalue distributions. And now it's useful to take the large n limits, so instead of uh, discrete eigenvalues, we'll have a, an eigenvalue distribution function. And this eigenvalue distribution function can be found, it is very well known. And well actually it's useful to go over to the density of eigenvalues, so it's just some change of variables. And the solution is given by Wigner semicircular, so the density of eigenvalues for the Gaussian matrix model looks like this. It has a compact support given, but in our case the support is given by, by alpha zero, and it looks like that. And the statement is that the path integral is now dominated by this kind of eigenvalue distribution. Can you recall alpha zero? Sorry? What is alpha zero? Alpha zero was essentially cut off square in four dimension. It's some constant which diverges, which I've introduced before. It's just, it depends on the mass, that's the point. Just a, something that we can compute. Okay, so this was the free case, but now it's very easy to treat also interactions because uh, if you add an interaction of this form, well, let's compute the, the, the partition function. Let's expand the interaction term. It will be just the product of traces of finally n, but these are precisely the, the observables that we've already computed. So I've just shown that for these observables, I can replace the, the free, the, the, the kinetic term by the Gaussian matrix model, and then of course I can evaluate it and I can sum it up back. I can sum it up and I can put it back in the in the action. And the conclusion is immediately that, at least observatively, um, the field theory if this action can be, sorry, the eigenvalue sector of this field theory can be described by this effective matrix model. So this is now Gaussian plus the directing terms. And this is, now this matrix model can be solved exactly non perturbatively and therefore it is very plausible that the non perturbative um, results of these matrix models should also describe the reasonable extent of least also the non perturbative thermodynamics of the original field theory. So this is what I'm going to analyze in a little bit more detail now. And this can be done now using edges on techniques. And let me do it, well, let me show some of the side. Ah, by the way, there is sort of the semi-classical picture of this. It's as follows. So if you have a classical field on, on some space, then the notion that the eigenvalue density is given, it's some kind, you should think of it as some kind of a non-local constraint on, on the classical field. So the difference to classical field theory is really is, is a very non-local one. And this is to some extent certainly consistent with the non-local UVR mixing and so on, which is known in these cases. So this is just a little, some, some pictures that perhaps you want to keep in mind. So these are just eigenvalues, it's some kind of a non-local property of the field. So now let's consider in detail the final the fourth model. So the original action, I can now, well, let's introduce the renormalized mass and the counter term. And now I can replace this action by the appropriate matrix model, which is what I've just explained. And the only thing to do is now to match the, the parameters of the field theory with the parameters of the matrix model. And in particular, in general, I would call now the interacting case, um, the scale of the eigenvalue distribution I would call alpha g. This will come up 
in a second. Um, so now you can just solve these matrix models, and essentially there are now two cases. The first case is a so-called single cut phase, where the eigenvalue distribution somehow well, it looks like this. So it's a deformation of, of Lina's law. However, then there is a, a phase transition, and there is a two cut case. And the phase transition is given by an eigenvalue uh, distribution which looks like that. <coughs> And, well, if you use the semi-classical picture that I told you before, it's, it's kind of plausible that this will have striped, striped patterns because the kinetic, here is a gap in the eigenvalue density and the kinetic term doesn't like jumps in the eigenvalue density. Therefore, there will be some kind of surface, surface energy. If you think, so there will be some kind of a two-fluid interpretation of, of such a picture and the two fluids will have a, a surface tension. So they will not, not like to mix and this should lead them to the striped pattern which was predicted by Kupsa and collaborated. So this is the intuitive picture. This is, these are just our results from the matrix models. And but let's apply first of all to the case of e cutting, so the single cut case. And now we can understand what is the origin of mass randomization in this model. Namely, well, okay, what I mean, mean quick coupling, I mean keep the eigenvalue distribution close to the minus law. And then what happens? So if you turn on the coupling, and the eigenvalue distribution will change a little bit. And in particular, the size of the eigenvalues will change. Now, if you want to match this with, with, with a free theory, with a particular finite mass, certainly you should keep the, the scale, so the size of the eigenvalues, close to the free case, as close to the free case as you can. And that sort of suggests that you should match the parameters in this way, so that the, this is the size of the eigenvalues in the interactive case, and this is the size of the closest free model with, with the renowned with critical mass and R. And this now leads to an implicit equations in, in some parameters which I'll solve in a second. And it leads in particular that you have to add a, a large negative mass to the, to the free uh, model in order to reproduce a finite physical mass. So if you now evaluate all this using the standard results from the matrix models, you find that the bare mass has to be renormalized by precisely this term. I, I emphasize that this is non conservative result from the matrix model. And it looks precisely like a conventional one-loop computation in the, in the field theory. That's, I find this quite funny. Um, but of course, I did do some approximation. I mean, sort of the approximation that I did is that I, I matched the, the scale of the eigenvalues using this reasonable approximation. So number the matrix model plus this um, input leads to the one-loop result from the theory. In particular, it sort of explains where the mass randomization can come from. You can do the same thing for the coupling, however, I can only compare the bare coupling to the free, to the free theory with the coupling for the matrix model. So it's not too interesting, but it gives you some kind of a control. It tells you if the bare couplings are small, then the model is really under control because the eigenvalue sector is really close to the free case. Now, very briefly, the phase transition. As I said, it happens if the eigenvalue distribution looks like this. And the conjecture or the claim is that this should describe the phase transition to the striped phase of Kupsa and Sondi in these models. Now again, we can just plug in the formulas and one finds now a critical line for this phase transition and perhaps just look at the picture. So if you express this critical line in terms of the parameters of the field theory, it looks like this. This is the bare coupling and this is the bare mass or cutoff square in the field theory. And you find that there is a critical line which actually ends at a critical point, at non-zero coupling. And this, I claim, this is really, this would really be correct. And in fact, one can easily understand the quality and the features of that. Namely, um, there is now a non-trivial critical point, and that should really be, be correct because the critical line which I had before is characterized by the particular eigenvalue distribution with two peaks, whereas the origin is the free model, and in the origin you have Wigner's law. So the eigenvalue distribution here is very different from here. So therefore, these two lines they cannot join. So the, the critical line cannot end at the origin. So it's, and then, the, moreover, you find that the, the phase transition is higher order rather than first order, which is actually support. I mean, higher order is found also numerically, so that seems to be correct. And you can now also, I'm finished, argue that while well, the existence of an end of critical point, where this critical line ends, that should correspond to a fixed point of normalization group. And therefore, well, it should have some kind of a reasonable continuum uh, meaning, and so you could now argue that there should be some kind of a non-trivial final the fourth model in the non-commutative case. And non-trivial simply because the eigenvalue distribution is different from the free case. 
So I mean, this is suggestive. I would say it's not proof. And well, there are some numerical checks which work out reasonably well in the two-dimensional case, which is all I can do for the moment. So let me conclude. And so we have seen that um, non-commutative scalar field theory has a has a sharp eigenvalue distribution just due to the UEIR mixing, and that it seems to be a useful characterization of this non-commutative field theory. In particular, it is very useful to, to take into account effects of interaction and compute randomization effects. And in particular, you can use all the sophisticated techniques that are known for matrix form. It gives you also an analytical description of the phase transition to the matrix of striped phase. And in particular, it checks out the existence of a non trivial critical point in four dimensions. And uh, obvious, while well, the next generalization would be to consider the Higgs sector. And it seems that similar techniques in that case should also be applicable, but this is work in progress. And probably this would, would have some kind of a, I mean, the phase transition is probably different from the usual phase transition in the Higgs sector, just because this is more like a matrix. So it could be interesting in physics. And what happens? Thank you. Thank you. So you are considering the photosphere with a constant V field. It's affecting about string theory. But this is, doesn't solve the string theory mm -hmm. solutions. I, I think well, this is not a topic for you, but it's just a comment more or less that. Well, what is it not about? This wouldn't satisfy the string equations of motion. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is really. You need constant H fields. Well, okay, no. Well, you could, you could embed all this in string theory, for example, using Myers effect. Okay. And it is actually a consistent background. Uh -huh. So in, in, in this. Like, I mean, if you add a transimus down, add a myosh, then it is really stable. But actually, these considerations are independent. Yeah, I understand, sure. The sharp characterization of the book is that the second line. Useful characterization of, of non commutative theory. Yeah, what is that? Well, uh, because sort of the interaction is late, I mean, the shape of the eigenvalue distribution corresponds to the interaction. So different interactions have, are characterized by different shapes of the eigenvalue distribution. So somehow the eigenvalue distribution encodes a lot of information for the field theory. Free, non-free, etc. Okay. 